This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the HP Spectre X360 15 inch again and again and again. We've re reviewed several generations of this. That's why I say that, including the most recent just a couple of months ago, which had Ultrabook quad core 8th generation CPUs and NVIDIA MX150 graphics. That model is still being sold. If you're interested in it, we have a review. Just use our channel search and you can find it. But this one is a new and interesting one. This one has the new Intel KB Lake G 8th gen CPUs inside. So these are quad core CPUs that have more wattage. They're just about the same as a Core i7-7700 HQ that you would find in a gaming laptop or a mobile workstation. That's a lot of power for something this skinny in a convertible design. Not only that, this is a new system on chip that Intel worked on with AMD, so it has the Radeon MX Vega MGL graphics inside. Yes, a lot of letters, but the, the upshot of that, it's about as powerful as the NVIDIA GTX 1050 to 1050 Ti, so entry-level gaming laptop graphics here. And even though this might not be one's first choice for a gaming laptop, you'll find out why that is, that still really can help you out if you do some 3D rendering sort of work, if you're looking for faster video export times for those kind of renders that actually use the GPU, stuff like that. So a lot of horsepower. So with the last generation, I nicknamed this, as you, you know if you've been watching my videos, Bob, best of the best. What about this one? Is the force with it? We're going to find out now. So the latest version of the Spectre X360 15 inch first became available on HP's website. I'm sure it'll trickle into retailers as well. As well. Now at HP's website, which I find to be not a very straightforward place, you go ahead and you choose the Spectre 15 inch 15T and then hit the customizable button and you can switch to this CPU configuration versus the one that we've already reviewed with the Ultrabook U series quad core CPU inside. So there you have it. Now, our, I expect that it will be in Best Buy eventually. In the United States, Best Buy kind of has a stranglehold on HP Spectre retailing, but we got ours from Computer Upgrade King, Cuck USA. They've been supplying some of our review loaners lately, and there's, it's nice to have an alternative, right? Because not everybody can or will shop at Best Buy. So they have this one for $15.99. Now, HP doesn't make a low-end version of this. You either get the one that we already reviewed, which was the Core i7-8550U with NVIDIA MX150, graphics, or you get this one, which is a Core i7-8705G with the AMD RX Vega M GL 4GB VRAM graphics inside. So there's, there's no Core i5s, for example, all that sort of thing. Now, what's really good, just like the last generation, and unlike many Ultrabooks, even 15-inch Ultrabooks, is it's relatively speaking upgradable. There's two RAM slots in here. That does well compared to Dell, who solders RAM on board for their 15-inch XPS 15 2-in-1, which is the only other direct competitor on the market right now. So you've got the versatility of going anywhere from 16, up to 32 gigs of RAM max, or you could even try to save some money and get 8 gig configuration. A computer upgrade king will sell it to you. They'll upgrade it for you so you can get different RAM configurations. There's one M.2 SSD slot supporting PCIe NVMe drives, fast SSDs in other words, and that's the only way HP sells it. And you can get those anywhere from 256 gigs, which is what you're going to get for that 1599 configuration along with 16 gigs of RAM. And you can go up to a 2 terabyte if you want SSD, which actually ours happens to have. It's, that's a, an expensive upgrade, but for those of you who need the storage, you can do it here. There's no hard drive bay in Spectre X360s. There's just simply no room for it. Just like the other model, again, you get an 84 watt hour battery inside. The charger has changed. It looks the same, but it's 150 watt. The other one, it was a 90 watt charger. That's because this one needs more juice. And actually that's more juice than it does need in terms of watts, but HP supports fast charging. So they always put more watts in the charger so it will charge more quickly. For 2018, HP has done a casing redesign. Now, it almost looks identical at first blush here. You've got that same dark ash finish, which is really pretty, does show fingerprint oil, and the contrasting gold around the edges for a little bling. I think it's a very good looking piece. I know a lot of people like it. Some of you might not, but it's attractive enough. So you still have the contrasting gold edges on it. You still have that dark ash finish, but the hinges now are completely gold. Before they were matching body finish with just a little line edge of gold. And the back angle, which used to have a kind of a rounded book spine look that I really liked a lot. It's probably more expensive to make. Now has got a more angular thing going on. I leave it up to you as to which you like. If you look at it from the sides, you see the same ports, the same controls. The only thing that they've added is a fingerprint scanner on the side edge of the machine, which is not 
the most convenient place for it. Oh well, that is what it is. They did that with the 13-inch the version previously to the, the fingerprint scanner. So you've still got two Thunderbolt 3 ports and they support four lanes, PCIe, good times there. One USB-A port, you got an HDMI full-size jack, you've got an SD card slot, of course a headphone jack. Anything else you need to accomplish, you can use USB-C dongles. You get the idea there. So it's USB-C Gen 2 supported here with those Thunderbolt 3 ports. Now one important thing to note is with the Core U series, the other model that we reviewed, that one had a USB-C charger. This one goes to a barrel pin charger, so that frees up both of your Thunderbolt 3 ports. You can still charge over Thunderbolt 3. Now HP machines can be a little bit picky about that, but I plugged it into our Dell Thunderbolt 3 dock. It's a big desktop dock and it worked for charging. It would say, that's not the official charger, fool, and I would say, that's fine, okay button, and it worked. The other significant change is the inside. Now there's a number pad on that keyboard. Before it was, there was no number pad. So there you have, it's still the same nice one and a half millimeter key travel white backlit keyboard. That's absolutely normal. So for those of you who don't like the Dell XPS 15 two in one, super low travel maglev keyboard, you have an option here to have a normal and pleasant keyboard. I like the keyboard just fine. It has nice damping, it has nice feel. It might not be the ultimate ThinkPad style keyboard, but it's, well, at least it's normal and it's decent. The Synaptics trackpad is slippery, slippery. You know, your finger just kind of goes whoop, whoop, whoop. So it feels less precise because it's a little hard to actually control your skating fingers across there. Uh, the trackpad by default also moves pretty quickly. It's a Synaptics trackpad, so there's, there are features. You can control that movement, and I, in fact, do slow it down a little bit. I know with some older generations of Spectre X360, some people found, particularly when it was plugged into an external extending monitor, that it was too slow. I don't think you're going to have that problem anymore. It's fast. So before we get into the whole horsepower thingy and how powerful it is and all that sort of thing, if you just bought the previous model with the core i7-ish 8550U, 15 watt CPU, uh, don't necessarily feel too bad because that's still a very powerful machine and you have entry level NVIDIA MX150 graphics in there. If you're using this for 2D art, I know a lot of you out there that, that watch my videos are 2D artists, then you don't need the maximum amount of horsepower. Honestly, I still would choose, I hate to say this, the Samsung Notebook 9 Pro because it has the best pen experience, even though it's not the sharpest knife in the drawer. It's not faster than this or the XPS 15 two-in-one. So yeah, you don't have to have this if you're doing 2D art. If you're just buying this for productivity because you want a chic, well-made product with a fairly large screen, 15.6 inches and 4K high res, the only way you can get one of these still is with a 4K IPS display, then yeah, you don't need the extra horsepower. But for those of you who found you were pushing the limits of other machines with Ultrabook CPUs and low-end dedicated graphics or maybe just Intel integrated graphics, say you're, you're doing video like we do. Either you're a serious hobbyist or maybe you do some of it professionally. You want more CPU horsepower and their renders are largely CPU done. But you know, there's some GPU rendering here too. With Premiere, you're going to get some acceleration. Still, Premiere does the best job of accelerating with NVIDIA graphics, but what can you do? Anyway, it'll be a step up if you're exporting 1080p or 4K graphics in your workflow. If you're doing 3D rendering work, if you're doing CAD work, this is more powerful. It will be faster as well. Even for compiling code, for those of you who are programmers, the faster the CPUs, and this is a faster CPU it'll be better. So it really, it depends on what you need there. So let's talk about the processor. It's the Core i7-8705G, 3.1 gigahertz with turbo boost to 4.1 gigahertz. So architecturally speaking, it's more like KB Lake where you have a higher base clock speed. The new eighth gen Coffee Lake, which are now up to six cores using gaming laptops and mobile workstations, they have lower base clock rates, but that's a uh, a subject for another video at this point. It's getting complex enough. This is still considered an 8th gen CPU. Like I said, you're almost up there with Core i7-7700 HQ performance, which means Dell XPS 15, the not two in one one, which means gaming laptops, that sort of thing. So that's a lot of power in some place, something this thin. The graphics truly do benchmark somewhere between an NVIDIA GTX 1050 and 1050 Ti, which is the bottom of NVIDIA's gaming GPU series. So much up higher than the NVIDIA MX150, which is not even really for gaming sort of thing. So if you want to use this for gaming, good luck to you. <laughs> no. uh, if you watch my Dell XPS 15 two-in-one review, you know that the problem here, it, this is a new architecture. So that's part of it. And AMD's drivers have been metsa metsa, not so great for the past year now when it comes to these non-gaming 
kind of architecture, non-desktop architecture products, so some games run really well. And it's the same story as with the XPS 15 2 and one Battlefield 1 runs like a champ. You can go with medium settings and 1080p resolution and hold close to 60 frames per second, which is what you want for a first-person shooter. Nice. I, once again, just like with the XPS 15 2 and one Far Cry 5, clearly some kind of incompatibility going on there, even though Far Cry supports AMD Radeon and has a splash screen that brags about the fact. Fallout 4 is fine, though, so don't buy one of these if you're really looking for a gaming laptop, but... It really, obviously, this is a chic convertible two-in-one for people who probably want it for note-taking, for art, to have something that's beautiful sitting on the desk for productivity. You can do some gaming on it on the road. Just don't expect every title to behave well. The good news is the thermals. I was sure that this was going to be a George Foreman grill and just fry the few hairs that I have on my leg right off. And it didn't. Now, this gets a little complex. And I'll tell you one thing, if you get this out of the box and you find it's running hot, try doing a factory reset. Because when we got ours, somebody had played with it first before it was shipped to us. And for some reason, when you right click on the desktop, there wasn't even the Radeon MX graphics control panel option coming up, which it should be. It was running hot. I don't know. So I said, huh, I'm going to reset this thing. And the core temperatures cooled right down, everything behaved, the graphics control panel showed up. So I don't know if there's a little iffy with the software load on the very earliest models. So if you got one, give that one try first and run HP's updater. Anyway, the upshot is, is it's not a frying pan. It's not horrible. It's not any hotter than the actual 8550U, U series 15 watt one. Now this is 65 watts for the CPU and for the graphics. So that's still not bad, you know, in terms of power, it's, it's up there, but not super duper up there compared to something like a GTX 1050 plus a Core i7 7700HQ. But now surprisingly, in benchmarks, and you can see the, the graphs that we have right here on screen, uh, when doing the 3D graphics benchmarks, the, the GPU typically doesn't get super duper hot. So it stayed in the 70s, sometimes it hit 80. Remember, with these things, about 100 degrees centigrade is allowable. And the CPU cores mostly stayed in the 80s. There were times HP is not really thermal throttling this much at all when it will go into the low 90s. That's getting a little worrisome, but that was the exception rather than the rule. When I was playing games that did work, like Battlefield 1, I saw CPU temperatures that were in the mid 80s. That's okay. That doesn't worry me. That doesn't make me think the machine is going to die in early death and the GPU temperatures were fine. Surface temperatures are decent on this, but it will get toasty. It's not going to singe your legs hairs off, but it's going to get toasty. And so I would suggest also for its ability to breathe and cool to not use this on your lap if you are doing something like playing Battlefield 1. If you're just streaming video, even if you're editing video in Premiere or something like that, then yeah, don't worry about it so much at all. And the CPU temperatures for the cores are typically in the 60s to 70s, which is fine. So for once, HP got cooling right with the Spectre series. That's a good thing. So what about using this as a convertible? Well, some of you are going to say, well, it's just bad. This is 2.08 kilograms, which is not exactly the lightest thing in the world. It's 19.3 millimeters thick, which is pretty thin, though not as thin as the 16 millimeter XPS 15 2-in-1. But there are those of us who want a bigger canvas for drawing on, for example. For those of you who take notes and feel cramped on a smaller screen, if you're doing any kind of diagramming, then the bigger screen is going to be nice. Clearly, you're going to be using this on your lap or on a table. You're not going to be standing there and sketching plein air and holding this thing up. It's on the heavy side. The hinges on it are pretty beefy. You can shake the thing and it doesn't wobble and it shouldn't annoy you. The hinges got a little bit beefier, I would say, with this generation. The pen on it is the same old HP pen. It's a matching color pen, a dark ash kind of thing. You get that and you get a slip cover in the box. Now, there are two pens available for this because HP likes to mess with you when it comes to pens. At least you get the pen in the box this time. Previously, they've sometimes not included the pen in the box. So the pen that you get is the same pen that we've covered before. It's a two button pen and it has a quadruple A battery that you stick inside. This one's in the box. For $30 more, if you're ordering it from HP or otherwise you're just going to have to buy it separately completely, you can get the new HP Tilt Pen, which even though there's a software control panel, it's called HP Tilt Pen, really doesn't support and tilt in any applications. Still, I don't know what's going on with HP in this tilt thing, you know. 
So I wouldn't worry about paying $30 extra for the tilt pen right now because it's just not doing much. The only nice thing is that it has a USB-C charging thingy. So, you know, for those of you who hate buying batteries that you have to replace every six months or year or something like that. So yeah, even in the Windows Sketchpad program where every pen technology that supports tilt, whether it's Entrig on Surface Pro 2017 model or Wacom AES 2.0, like on the XPS 15 201, uh, this still won't even do tilt there. But other than that, it's pretty good. This is Entrig technology, which is the same thing Microsoft uses for their service products. 4,096 levels of pressure sensitivity. Still has a higher uh, initial activation force, which means you have to press a, a little bit harder than you with Wacom AES, most recent generation, certainly compared to Wacom EMR. But it's not terrible. If you have a super, super light touch, you, know, you barely touch the screen and you're drawing the hairs on somebody's head, you're going to have to press a little harder. But other than that, it's perfectly capable for doing some fine quality art, art. I was able to do a concept art drawing quickly, easily, without a problem. Palm rejection is still not the best in the world. I just find Entrig is the, the, the last place when it comes to palm rejection. So I tend to wear an art glove if I'm doing that. Now, if you're note taking, I know you probably don't want to use a glove because you're going to look dorky in the meeting room and all that sort of thing. So just make sure that it sees the pen tip first. The hover distance when it detects the pen is going to be key. So it detects the pen before your palm. Hover distance is not very large. The display on this is a slightly different bow Hydus panel than was used in the <laughs> the other version that we recently reviewed. I suspect that there's no meaning in that other than the fact that they're using multiple panel suppliers and probably slight revisions. The, the metrics on it are just about the same. Brightness is decent at 331 nits. It's not class leading, but HP usually tries to save on battery power by not going with super bright. All the other metrics are perfectly in line with the last generation one. You got almost full sRGB coverage and the usual 74%-ish of Adobe RGB. The only thing that was kind of out of line was the white point was way too high. But with calibration, it looks lovely. I always felt with the HP display that it looks better than it looks even on paper. It looks quite nice. It's very pleasant for watching movies. And again, it's 4K and it's IPS. There is no other options. It's going to be touch. It's going to be pen. It's going to be 4K all day, all night. The speakers on it, you got the usual Bang & Olufsen software control panel going on and two up-firing stereo speakers. And HP speakers have always been anemic. It's like they're mousy. They're afraid of making too much noise. And this one has gotten a little bit louder. This one I can actually hear if I want to watch a Netflix video while I'm using the exercise bike. So they've improved things there. There's still not a heck of a lot of bass here, but at least you can hear them. <laughs> There's that. So how about battery life? Well, 84 watt hour six cell battery sealed inside nominally. If you take it apart, you can get to the battery by unscrewing the bottom cover. That's the same as on the Ultrabook series CPU model, but obviously this one's going to consume more power and we have the power hungry 4K display. So you can probably figure out that this is not going to last as long in terms of battery life as the one with the Core i7-8550U 15 watt CPU and lower end NVIDIA graphics inside. So that'll be a deciding point for you too as to which one you choose. If you want the more horsepower but you can live with the lower battery life, then you'll choose this one. So whatever HP claims, we just don't even pay attention anymore because like most PC manufacturers, they say crazy things like they'll say, oh, it can play 10 hours, of, you know, of video. And they'll put in the fine print that that's running it at 720p resolution at some low brightness. But whoever would buy a 4K laptop to do this? I don't know. Not me. Anyway, like the XPS 15 2-in-1, it's about a six to seven hour machine. If you're doing it for productivity, streaming video, even drawing in Photoshop, you know, with 140 nits of brightness, not super duper bright, but bearable, that kind of thing. If you're going to be pushing it harder, obviously you're going to have shorter battery life. All right, ladies and gents, how about getting inside? Get ready for another rant, which I do every time I open up a Spectre. They make it so hard to do. I don't know why they actually have a service manual because they clearly don't want you inside of there. You have two little Torx T5 screws here. Now, on the back edge, there are four hidden long Phillips head screws like so. So before they had the rubber foot that you have to peel off carefully so you can get to those. Well, they've added another layer of annoyance here uh, between... <laughs> that and here we have a clear strip so you go to unscrew those screws you're like the screw won't, the driver won't go in because you actually have to peel that off carefully as well so you take off your four phillips head screws then you discover clips on the side that are so tenacious i don't know they could probably suspend me from the ceiling you finally get it off and you're inside and boy you're gonna say i never want to do that again so do everything you want to do when you're inside here here's our internals here's our fan here's our fan so pretty self-explanatory there here is some mylar tape and we can pull that back and see that it's covering heat pipes so we've got what looks like 
two heat pipes. Let's just yank everything off, why don't we? There we go. No more adhesive and mylar over here. They're going to definitely know if you've been inside and tearing this up. Yep, two heat pipes. And under here, we probably have our two inconveniently located ram saws. Just inconvenient because you're going to have to pry this off first to get to those. And these are EMI shields. These are just interference shields. So yes, we got two ram slots right here, which is charming, right? You usually don't see two ram slots on skinny ultrabook convertible type machines. So good times there. DDR4 2400 megahertz ram. Two slots. So you can go all the way up to 32 gigs if you go with two 16 gig modules. Also a rarity. Most convertible 15 inch ultrabooks cap at 16 gigs of RAM. Our two stereo speakers are right porting over here. And what's this over here underneath the ribbon cable? That's our M.2 SSD. Just like the Ultrabook version of this we reviewed with the U-Series CPU, it's underneath the ribbon cable, so you've got to carefully remove the ribbon cable connector first if you want to get to this and swap it out. Lastly, that's the Wi-Fi card, which is not socketed. It's not socketed on the Dell XPS 15 either. I guess they just didn't have room for that. And Obviously, the rest of it is your big old battery. So if you wanted to repaste your CPU and GPU, if you were feeling adventurous there, then you'd have to peel off the rest of this stuff that I've <laughs> already done a number on right here. Peel that all off, get rid of the fuzzy stuff, and here's the screws for that right here. So it looks like four-corner screw design. That's a good thing, not a tripod heat sink. So that's what's under there. So there you have it, the HP Spectra X360 15 inch with AMD graphics inside, a more powerful beast. And as I said, you know, <laughs> the last generation was uh, was not quite a George Foreman grill, but it was pretty darn hot. So I was really worried about this one, but the good news is that HP really has managed to control the thermals. Yes, it's a warm running machine, particularly the thin design in the metal right here. You'll feel some heat and the core temperatures. They're hot, but they're not alarming. It's not terrible. It's not any worse than the Dell XPS 15 2-in-1, which is its only direct competitor. So good times there. So you're getting all that power and it's probably not going to kill itself, which is really what I care about most in a laptop. You want it to last, right? Nice 4K display. You get a number pad now if you care about that. A normal keyboard. Let's hear for normal travel keyboards. It's all good stuff. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool tech videos and thumbs up if you like this vid.